Yes, I am the River Friendly Coordinator at the Watershed Institute. Thanks for joining us today. This is the River Friendly webinar series, and today's webinar is on harmful algal blooms and aquatic invasive species. We do have a webinar next week at the same time, Wednesday at noon. Um, next week's webinar is also free. It's going to be on groundwater protection and well, well stewardship. So please join us for that one as well. We do have more webinars scheduled for June, so stay tuned um, and keep an eye out for those. I'm going to do a quick introduction on the River Friendly program, and then I will turn it over to our speakers. So if you don't know the River Friendly program, we are um, a program that is a recognition or certification program for um, organizations and individuals to improve their environmental stewardship. It's a non-regulatory free program, and there are three organizations that partner to administer the River Friendly program, which are the Watershed Institute, Raritan Headwaters and New Jersey Water Supply Authority. Um, we work with different organizations, including businesses, golf courses, schools, as well as residents or individuals. And we also have a community partner program for anyone that doesn't fit into those other four categories. We are primarily focused on the Raritan River watershed, which is the map on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and if you are interested in learning more information about us, please check out our website. It's at www.njriverfriendly.org. Um, so there's a lot more information there about us. Um, on the resources tab on our website, this webinar um, will be posted in a day or two. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available for anyone to access on our website. The resources page looks like this, and it'll just be a link um, that will take you to the webinar recording. So feel free to share with your friends. Just a little bit um, of tech tips. So um, if you're having trouble with your connection or hearing us, um, if you mouse down to the bottom of the WebEx screen, there is a circle with three vertical dots. Um, and if you hold your mouse over that, there is a um, option for audio connection. If you click on that, um, you can actually type in your phone number and WebEx will call you and you'll be able to hear um, the webinar through your phone. If you have any questions while for our speakers while they're presenting, um, please type them into the chat box, which you can also find um, by um, like scrolling down to the bottom of the WebEx screen um, and there's a little chat circle. So type your uh, questions in there and after each of our presenters, we'll have a question and answer session um, where I'll ask the presenters your questions and hopefully they'll give you answers. Um, if you could please mute your microphones, most of them are probably automatically muted when you entered WebEx, but please keep them muted throughout the speaker so there's um, little background noise. And with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Kyle Clonin from New Jersey Water Supply Authority. He's going to talk about aquatic invasive species. Um, after that, we're going to have Heather Desco, who is also from New Jersey, also from from New Jersey Water, Water Supply Authority. Authority. And she's going to be and talking she's gonna about harmful algorithms. So, so um, um, without further ado, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Kyle. Pass it over to Kyle. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so again, uh, my name is Kyle. I'm with the New Jersey Water Supply Authority. Um, and I'm going to try to go over three things today. Uh, first, why are we concerned specifically about aquatic invasive species and what problems do they cause? Um, a lot more, a lot of people are more familiar with terrestrial invasive species. Um, and I want to go over that and what you can do as a boater, fisherman, stream monitor, or someone who just likes interacting with the water in any way, whether it be walking your dog along the docks or anything. And at the end, 
I will run through some examples of AIS that are in our water bodies or ones we are concerned about invading New Jersey. Um, so it'll be much too quick for anybody to really memorize identification, but I'm hoping that you can keep this or the links I provide as a reference in case you see something um, while you are out on the water and are concerned and then can report it to um, someone to come confirm and hopefully get early detection and response going so it doesn't become a huge problem. Uh, so a quick background on us, um, both me and Heather who will present next are from the New Jersey Water Supply Authority, which is a state authority created in 1981 to oversee all water supply facilities owned by the state. Uh, this includes the Raritan system, which is Spruce Run and Round Valley Reservoirs, as well as the Delaware and Raritan Canal. That's the area up there in the blue, um, as well as the Manasquan system, which where we have a pump station on the Mamsquan River, um, which provides water for the Mamsquan Reservoir um, down south in the pink. Um, together, all four water bodies um, double as state or county parks and provide about 2 million people with drinking water. So the way that this works is that we sell the raw water to water purveyors that you may be more familiar with, like New Jersey American or Middlesex Water Company. They treat it and they distribute it um, to residential homes and businesses. Part of the New Jersey Water Supply Authority is the Watershed Protection Unit. We function with watershed planning, water monitoring, restoration, stormwater pollution prevention programs and outreach. So that is how under this we have control of in aquatic invasive species and HABs, um, our involvement in the River Friendly Program, and we also look after some preserved properties um, and are concerned with some terrestrial things as well. That was a few weeks ago, we had Nick speak on um, trees. He looks after a lot of our preserved properties. So looking at controlling aquatic invasive species or invas any invasive species, it's beneficial to think of it kind of a long curve where if you look at the bottom left over there, you have when species are absent and then as time goes on, and the area infested grows larger and control costs grow larger, um, it becomes increasingly hard to deal with them. So in the early stages before something has established itself, this is the most cost effective way to reduce problems of invasive species. Uh, this is through preventing it through public education and introduction restrictions. This can be done through boat inspections and proper washing of equipment before traveling between water bodies. Um, as far as terrestrial goes, there's been some recent municipal ordinances which ban the planting of invasive species in residential lawns. Moving on to the eradication stage, this is like an early detection rapid response stage where we still have a chance at completely removing an infestation before it can spread and take over a water body and spread or spread to multiple water bodies. As you move along, you get more into containment and resource protection and long-term management where your goals shift to in stopping the spread of core population, active management is necessary, the public becomes aware of the problem, and eventually pollution, um, the populations may be too widespread to be adequately controlled everywhere, so your strategy might shift more to reducing pop populations to lowest feasible levels and focusing more on your highly valued resources or areas that you really need to be clear. So what can aquatic invasive species be? They include anything from plants to invertebrates like crabs. Um, they can be fish, they can be reptiles and amphibians, mollusks, mammals, or any sort of pathogen or disease that are traveled through these. Um, some people think that Didymo is a invasive in New Jersey, it's it's not. It can certainly get to a uh, nuisance level. Um, same thing with algae, even though like later we will talk about cyanobacteria and some harmful effects of algae. They are not invasive, um, but they, they can still be dangerous. So what do these things cause that are different than just um, in terrestrial lands where we know about ecological damage. Um, when you're looking at water specifics, they can do things like clogging pipes and culverts. This reduces flow. This can impact flooding. It can impact water quality, such as dissolved oxygen levels, and it can affect recreational 
boating, fishing, if things become too thick with plants, or um, drinking water supplies, like drinking water intakes. I'm going to go over two examples of things we have had to deal with um, at the authority. The first is water chestnut. So you can identify water chestnut by seeing the floating, it's a floating plant um, with triangle shaped leaves and large teeth. They together form a rosette, it's called on the top. Um, and so they um, grow from sharp four pointed fruits in the sediment, which are spiky and they will hurt you if you happen to step on them along the side of a lake or grab them if they're in your boat. Um, so eradication really needs to focus on the removal of these fruits from the sediment. They can remain viable for up to 12 years. Um, detriments include covering surface water. This can restrict light availability to the bottom, reduce oxygen content, and if it gets thick enough, reduce recreational activities. So here's a picture of floating water chestnut in the center there. Um, just want to remind everybody if um, you could keep yourselves on mute, if you could check yourselves, that would be great. Um, so here's a picture of the floating water chestnut. You can see how it covers the top in a rosette and it's thick. Um, so, yeah. Um, moving on, here is an example of it completely covering a lake. So this is an example of our, where we've had to actively manage along the south branch of the Raritan River. Um, so along the south branch, New Jersey Water Supply Authority maintains an intake pond and a pump station, which fills the Round Valley Reservoir. So you can see that building on the right, that's our pump station. Uh, we have a seven acre lake, or seven acre holding pond, sorry, which has become infested with water chestnut um, over the past several years. There is a concrete wall between the flowing area of the south branch. So you can kind of see where there's a straight line there. Um, that concrete wall allows some water to come over the top and fill the pond. Um, and then our intake takes from the pond. So this is an aerial from August in 2016. This is only a year after the weeds were cut. Um, which were mostly water chestnut, but also some other invasives. Uh, we used a weed harvester, which took out a total of 588 cubic yards. And as you can see, they came back um, a year later in very full force. And by 2017, we had to harvest again and took out 900 cubic yards of weeds, um, where it was noted that thousands of the fruits came up and that really the only way to manage this problem would be to dredge the full pond. So again, all these efforts take um, time, they take money. And this is something that um, full dredging of the pond is on the authority's agenda and will have to be um, completed to continue our um, necessary operations. Um, now, besides this being in a drinking water facility, obviously if this was an area of a more recreational lake or pond, that would cause problems as well. You're not going to get a boat through there. You're not going to get a propeller through there. If you try to fish in there, your line's going to get stuck. So these cause problems um, from recreation and utility perspectives as well. A second plant that we've had to deal with is hydrilla. So recognizing hydrilla, um, you can look at the serrated edges and their whorls of normally five leaves. If you look at the top picture there, um, how the leaves come out kind of in a circular pattern from the stem is called the whorl. And you may be able to see that the uh, leaves have serrations. Now, they can reproduce in three different ways. Um, they can reproduce through tubers, which are starchy, hard, sort of baby potato-like structures that they leave in the sediment. Uh, you can see pictures of those in the hand on the bottom. They have turians, which come off the plant itself, and fragments as well, as, as small as an inch big. So if it's chopped up in a propeller, you've just created a bunch more hydrilla, which can spread and regrow, or it can stick to your boat and spread between water bodies. This is a plant native to Asia, 
It's typically an aquarium plant and um, it is very hard to manage and it is evil. And so what in particular makes this so hard to deal with? It has an amazing ability to adapt to a variety of conditions. It can live in low light. It has been found in water depths up to from inches to 35 feet. It can reach the surface. It can grow in mats. It even survived in up to 10 weeks in total darkness. And uh, we ourselves have found it at 22 feet deep in the Manasquan Reservoir. It survives in stagnant waters like lakes and ponds. It can survive in more fluvial environments like rivers and canals. And it can grow in both fresh and brackish waters. So it can now compete uh, submerged, other submerged aquatic vegetation, other biota in the water. It affects water chemistry, it affects water flow. And by growing in those mats again, it can affect recreation. Um, changing the habitat for fish and making it hard to navigate the waters. It costs a lot to manage. Um, it can quickly take over and grow those mats as seen at the bottom. Individual water bodies can spend anywhere between $20,000 to $3 million annually just to manage hydrilla. Um, Florida as a whole has an infestation so bad. Um, these are some pictures of areas in Florida. They spend about 18 to 35 million a year just to manage hydrilla. That's not all aquatic invasive plants, but um, just hydrilla. There are two different like biotypes, technically, um, dioecious monoecious. They have a different type down there than we have up here, but um, largely um, same effects and threat and scariness. Um, thankfully, we are not quite there yet in New Jersey. It is a relatively recent infestation in New Jersey, and we still have the opportunity for containment. Uh, this is a map from 2018 showing where New Jersey it had been confirmed. Um, and so we really like to contain it, make sure that it doesn't spread too far. And this is why uh, the Water Supply Authority is working so hard to make sure it doesn't spread between uh, outside of the two water bodies that we have. We have it in the canal as well as the Manasquan Reservoir. It's in the highlighted red section of the um, canal up there, if you can see that on the thing. And this is Heather. As you can see, it has grown to be um, using a rake toss. It is as thick and as large as her. Um, she's the hydrilla queen of New Jersey because she looks after both of our projects. And so um, the effects that it has had on us, the authority has a long history of managing aquatic plants in the DNR canal and has typically used a traditional mechanical removal. Um, in 2016, vegetation was reported so dense that the water level of the canal is actually below one of our water users intakes. So it was so matted and thick that it was holding the water back. And during this investigation was when we first discovered the hydrilla infestation in the canal. And then the next year we found it in the Manasquan Reservoir. Um, the problem with going back to a traditional mechanical removal is that again, it spreads through fragmentation. So if we were to rip it up, um, like you see as a mechanical remover on the picture on the left, that would increase the spread uh, it, was, it would cut it up and possibly make thicker and allow for more reproduction in the canal, spread downstream, or get stuck to the spread um, to the harvester and then spread between motor bodies on there. So in 2017, the authority initiated a low dose fluoridone herbicide treatment to manage the hydrilla. Um, looking at our options, we felt like this was the best to truly contain it because it wasn't fragmenting it. And then it's a systemic herbicide, so it looks to control the travels through the plant and will control the tuber reproduction as well to stop the tuber bank from growing and stop it from growing in years to come because tubers that are in the sediment can stay viable from like six to ten years so even after you may not see hydrilla anymore it's important to keep treating to make sure that it doesn't come back um, we use a different form of the same herbicide fluoridone in a pilot treatment the last two years at the Manasquan Reservoir. At both these sites, it's a slow release, long exposure method. So this has a very low application rate of about two to four PPB. Um, 
For reference, the EPA acceptable level is 150 parts per billion. So we hope that at this level, fluoridone selects for hydrilla while allowing desirable native plants to survive. At this low dose, fluoridone is also safe in drinking water. Um, it'll come out in the treatment plants. Um, it's safe. It has no recreation restriction, doesn't, is not known to impact animals. It's something that's been in use um, in other areas of the country since their early 80s and has been uh, deemed pretty safe. And, um, you know, as a, for instance, again, talking about um, time and effort that's put into managing these plants so we can deliver the water to our customers over the first three year contract of the DNR canal cost um, management. It cost us over a million dollars. This has now been exceeded, extended into a fourth year um, and will likely continue for another couple of years. Um, as we talked about depleting the seed bank, we need to ensure that the plan is to continue treating and managing for at least two or three years after the last hydrilla was spotted. Last year, we found one hydrilla and one tuber. So it means we're still going to work. Um, related high hydrilla, but not something we've had to manage so far, is Brazilian elodea or Brazilian waterweed, um, which gives me nightmares as it's basically hydrilla on steroids. If you look at it, it is much thicker than hydrilla, hardier. Um, you can tell a difference because the whorls are typically in whorls of four. Uh, its edges are not visibly serrated. Um, it was recently found in New Jersey. We um, a coworker came across it in a private pond last year. So going back to that curve from the beginning, this is certainly in the early detection and rapid response phase, and it's something that would, would could be you know devastating some water bodies would spread. Just thinking about those pictures I showed before of the hydrilla mats. Um, here's a comparison between hydrilla, uh, the Brazilian elodea or waterweed, and elodea, which is the native. Um, to this area, which is also known as common waterweed. And you can really see how thick and hardy the Brazilian um, type is compared to the others. There's a little more, at least in this picture, spacing in between the leaves on hydrilla. Um, Elodea will be smaller and daintier um, and has a different amount of whorls, I mean, leaves per whorl. And um, so those are three Again, LOD is our native, and then hydrilla and uh, Brazilian LOD are both invasive species. So um, what can you do? Are you scared of anything yet? Um, I hope you'd like to help us stop the spread. One thing you do is please do not dump your unwanted fish or aquarium plants in the public water body. Um, this is a great way for them to spread, whether it be the fish themselves, which are likely possibly invasive, um, as well as any sort of plants that you have in there. As I go over some things later, there's kind of a theme here where many of the plants are, uh, many aquarium plants or many of our invasive plants start as aquarium plants before invading local water bodies. So there's plenty of other ways to get rid of your fish by taking them to a pet shop or online or, you know, burying it in the backyard. Um, just please don't put it in the reservoir. As mentioned, control and prevention are the best and most cost effective measures. Um, education and awareness are our first lines of defense, especially because so many of these spread through fragmentation and can hitchhike, as people put it, on equipment from people's activities like your waders, like your fishing equipment or your boat. Um, this is why they've been given the nickname Aquatic Hitchhikers, and there's a federally sponsored Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers multi-state campaign. Um, which focuses on checking, cleaning, draining, and drying your boat. We also ask that people educate others and report their sightings. So I'm going to go over examples of how to do all that. Here's a picture of a boat coming out of the water infested with AIS. Um, as you can see, many spots of your trailer or your boat can grab hold of the vegetation and pull it out. And then if you don't properly clean it and quickly go back to another water body, these are how these fragments spread and take root and can regrow. Proper cleaning includes things like allowing your boat to dry for at least five to seven days. That ensures that anything, whether it be a plant or a mollusk, 
or anything else that is stuck to your boat uh, will have enough time to die. Pressure washing, um, ensure using you uh, hot water or things like commercial car washes, cleaning detergents and agents like homemade things like vinegar and bleach. There's plenty of stuff online. Same as you, you know, wash, making sure that you wash your boat and then also um, washing your waders and other fishing equipment to ensure that nothing is hitchhiking on you and that you're not the one spreading things from water body to water body. Um, another effort, something that we've just started at the authority are boat inspection stewards. Um, this is something that if you're part of a nonprofit that looks over or a group that looks over um, any sort of friends of a water body group or us, uh, last year we partnered with the Monmouth County Park System to start a boat inspection steward program. We had a, two interns that would work um, from Friday to Saturday and check out boats. So uh, this was based off the New York state model. It's been gaining traction in many um, New England states and Pennsylvania. It's not really here in New Jersey yet. Um, there may have been a small one at Lake Hapakong and then uh, this was a very more established one that we tried to put on last year. New York and Vermont actually have laws against the transportation of aquatic species. And I believe Vermont has a law that if a steward is present at a boat launch, you have to do it. In most places, uh, having an inspection is a voluntary action. And so again, we started at 2019, in 2019, it's Monmouth County Park System um, at the Mamasquan Reservoir. We are gonna do that again this year. And we are hoping also to spread to Spruce Run in 2020 as well to help protect that water body. So the way this works is that one of the stewards will speak with and give a uh, visual and verbal survey looking for and marking any species that they find on a boat or equipment. They'll speak with the owner to talk about where the last spot water body they went to, where they'll be going next, and some other questions to help us assess the general level of awareness on aquatic invasives. This is taken on a tablet, which is then uploaded online where we can view the data and analyze it and do things like come up with these spider maps. Now on the left, you see a spider map from a uh, what's known as a prism in the Adirondacks in New York. So they have multiple boat launches with these and they can create these maps showing how the most traveled water body routes. So this helps in identifying if it's, you know, hey, this one water body has a, um, has an invasive species. How susceptible is my water body to it? Seeing how often travel pathways, most popular travel pathways can help you gauge that risk. While we didn't have um, many others in New Jersey, so we can make a connection diagram like that, we still made a map of where people were saying they came from last in New Jersey. The red dots there show areas where hydrilla has been found before. The green is the Manasquan Reservoir. And as you can see, people are going all over the state. This is just focusing on the state. If we had one showing everywhere, it would have um, been too out of scale to show here. But we had people, we found someone came in from Florida who still had algae on them. Uh, people have been coming to and from the Great Lakes and plenty of places in Pennsylvania and Connecticut to Manasquan Reservoir as well. Uh, so we completed about 2,000 surveys and about 97 people who were approached took the survey. Uh, vegetation was found on 18% of launches and 55% of retrievals. That's expected because it would be higher on retrievals, right? Because people hadn't had time to clean their boats yet. Most people did say that they practiced at least one form of boat cleaning. So um, that is, you know, something something to be aware of that even though most people practice a boat, um, about a fifth of launches still had some sort of vegetation on them. So perhaps cleaning methods were inadequate and it's really important to make sure that we dry those boats out. About 55% of boats were used within the last seven days, which leads again to that knowledge that things uh, need to be dried out to make sure these plants or other invasive species senesce before moving between water bodies. Um, a way to report is through the NJ Invasive Species app run by the Invasive Species Strike Team. 
Uh, you can, this helps managers locate and track the spread, prepare management efforts. This um, data from here is also frequently shared with other bases like the USGS um, nuisance aquatic species database. And that helps us do things like visualize those spider maps and see what could be coming and what um, we're vulnerable for. There are also some working groups in New Jersey. The New Jersey Water Monitoring Council has a decontamination protocols work group. Um, they'll have a protocol on decontamination finalized in spring 2020, which will provide a standard procedure for water monitoring to reduce the spread between water bodies. The Water Supply Authority and the NJDEP are both members of the Mid-Atlantic Panel on Aquatic Invasive Species. Um, being a part of this and other professional organizations like the Northeast Aquatic Plant Management Society has helped us to coordinate with other states' effort, learn from their experiences on management and outreach efforts like the Stewart Program. The panel also provides grants for small initiatives for states with AIS management plans or aquatic invasive species management plans when I say AIS, or to help states develop a plan. Currently, uh, New Jersey is one of only seven states, or maybe less than that now, who do not have an AIS management plan. Um, the state does have an invasive species management plan, which was completed in 2009, but that plan doesn't include specific recommendations for aquatic plants and animals. Uh, so if we were to have a plan in place, the state would then be eligible for more funding from the federal government through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, for instance, the state plan grant program distributed uh, about $15,000 to each state within its plan in fiscal year 2018. And um, learning from other states, having a coordinated plan for the state would definitely help to manage AIS. Um, now I'm gonna go through some quick um, aquatic invasive ID before handing it off to Heather. Now, I hope that this and the links I'll provide at the end, like the main stewards, um, Lake stewards programs identification and some other online tools to help you as a reference. I don't expect anyone to memorize identification just here, but these are some things to be aware of and keep your eyes open for and possibly report or look into whether you let somebody know through the Invasive Species app, if it's in the Raritan or another area, we'd be happy to look at it um, to try to confirm and see if there's a new infestation. Um, Eurasian water milfoil. So this is actually something that's not always actively managed for because it is just so widespread um, on that kind of graph before this would be in the, in the far right established um, man, uh, graph of invasive species. So, this forms thick tangled mats of the vegetation, which can, um, a vegetation which can reach the water surface and really jam up a propeller. They were accidentally introduced and spread by boats and waterfowl. Um, they're kind of smooth leaves and they are another one that outcompetes native plants and spreads through fragmentation. Now, the curly leaf pondweed is something you can view it also forms these thick mats at the water's edge if you see it you can kind of think skinny crunchy these lasagna noodles if you see that up at the top that's a one of the single strands of it it's another one that forms through fragmentation um, if you're picking up on a theme here parrot feather um, this is an interesting one because it can break the water surface um, and be known as an emergent plant if you look at the top picture there the that's the bud of the plant that um, can reach out of the water. It's a South American origin aquarium plant. Again, um, many aquarium or origins here. Um, so proper management and disposal of that is very important. Um, they have submerged leaves with whorls of mostly five and smooth margins. Um, tips may have a reddish hue. Those smooth margins, um, when I see it as, could remind you of Eurasian water milfoil, but then again, these have the emergent um, part to them. Another one that spreads through whole plants or fragmentations on fishing equipment, boating equipment, um, or animals. Some of these, especially their seeds, are able to pass through digestive tracts or stick to animals just like they stick to and hitchhike on boats. 
Uh, fanwort has leaves resembling flat open fans with handles and the handle of the fan would be the petiole. Their submerged leaves are finely divided and branch in opposite pairs along the main stem. It's another one that spreads through fragmentation, um, another aquarium plant. And they can have small white petaled flowers. Um, so that's interesting. That's something that we've seen at the Manasquan Reservoir's Environmental Education Center run by the Monmouth County Park System. There's a small pond out there with a very, very happy um, population of fanwort that we saw flowering last year. The zebra mussel is native to the Black and Caspian Seas. This is one of the more famous aquatic invasive species um, due to its proliferation in the Great Lakes. It's less than two inches long. Its colors can vary from dark to pale, and they're notorious for their biofouling capabilities. They can colonize water supply pipes. Um, they can stick to boats. Now, uh, supposedly, it's not New Jersey, but if you look at that map there, it's kind of all around New Jersey. It's been um, seen in the... And so, you know, this might be something that might not not be in New Jersey, it might just not be reported yet in New Jersey. Um, something that is in New Jersey is the New Zealand mud snail, which was confirmed in the Muskinetcong River. Um, looking at the penny up there, you can see that they are tiny. They have about, a, they're about a third of an inch long with right-handed coils of five teeth coils on the shell from gray to dark brown and a plate that covers the opening. They can survive passing through digestive tracts of fish and birds so they can move, you know, along with fish and birds between water bodies, and they can result um, in new population through asexual reproduction. So even if one comes in to a new water body, um, over three years, you can re-sexually produce to up to 40 million new snails from just that one mud snail, and it can now compete other grazers and have effects on natural macroinvertebrates. Um, the last one I'm going to go over here is the Chinese mitten crab. So this is an example of, besides just aquariums, how things can come in through kind of, you know, cultural practices as well. Earlier in the year, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service confiscated 15,000 live Chinese mitten crabs at airports in the 120 days leading up to the Chinese New Year. Um, as part of law enforcement activities, they're native to China and Korea and considered a culinary delicacy in uh, much of Asia. And they've been seen in the Hudson River and Chesapeake and Delaware Bays, as well as the Great Lakes and the San Francisco Bay, where they have been known to clog um, water intakes. They have brown, shiny, spiny shells, um, furry, quote unquote, mittened claws. Their carapace can be up to three inches in diameter. And again, they cause a number of um, things like outcompeting natives, clogging intakes, and um, they can hurt commercial and recreational fishing activities by consuming bait and damaging uh, fishing nets. Um, so that's all I have, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, two things to look out for here, and we'll link to these later in a uh, follow-up this presentation will be available the main guide main field guide to invasive aquatic plants is uh, you can purchase it as a field guide or it's also freely available online um, and that is a really great resource for helping to identify invasive plants um, the usgs non-indigenous aquatic species program um, has a database online that's where i got that picture before for the New Zealand mud, not the New Zealand mud snail, but the uh, zebra mussel. And um, if you have um, any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks so much, Kyle. That was great. Um, the only question I think we have right now is can harvested water test them? Insufficient, insufficient to kill the seeds. Um, honestly, I'm not sure. I know um, as long as you are, I don't know if it would kill the fruit. 
I'm not sure. That's something that I could look up and get back to you. Um, I know the rest of it, I, you know, the, the vegetative part, I'd be confident um, that you could compost. Um, I know that we've just gotten rid of it before by um, giving it to municipal compost waste. So um, I would assume so, just as long as, you know, you mostly make sure that it doesn't wind up uh, back in the water body. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions, all the questions for, you right now. for you right now. So we can move on to Heather if you like. Heather if you like. Okay. Um, let me just figure out how to stop sharing. Okay. So thank you. Heather's here. I'm going to pass the presentation abilities over to Heather. Yep. I don't, I don't see your thing yet, but I can. Okay. All right. Everybody can hear me just fine, hopefully. Um, so thanks so much. I'm glad to be here today to give you all a primer on harmful algal blooms. Um, so some of the things that Kyle mentioned of being aware and if you see something, say something um, still apply when it comes to HABs. Um, so, but the first thing I want to cover here is that, you know, harmful algal blooms, what we really mean or what you probably hear about when you normally hear about harmful algal blooms is actually we're talking about cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms. Hey, Heather. Yep. Can you see my presentation? I can't see your PowerPoint yet. Okay. Can you, Kyle? No. Okay. Did it come through? I can try to change the abilities again. There you go. Okay. All right. We got it. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Because you needed to see this really lovely visual here. All right. Um, so I said when we um, when we're talking about harmful algal blooms, we're really talking about um, cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms. Um, I am going to discuss the distinctions between cyanobacteria and true algal bloom. Um, but so there's a lot of things in here. So fasten your seatbelts, folks. Um, going to try and pack a lot of science and do a very short presentation here. Um, and please note that I am not a microbiologist uh, or a public health official. I consider myself an ecologist. Um, I coordinate our water monitoring programs at the Water Supply Authority. Um, so that's kind of the angle that I come at this from. Um, and I provide support on our source water quality management projects. Um, but there's a lot of expertise that I rely on um, out there for information, guidance, and decision making um, when it comes to HABs, especially. Um, so you should always do that too. All right. Heather? Yep. Sorry to interrupt once more, but we have a request to potentially turn up your microphone if that's at all possible. If not, that's okay. Let me try. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Does this sound better? Maybe. <laughs> I think it sounds good. So. Thank you. All right. Um, so you've seen these um, ripped from the headlines. We talk about algae blooms. You see them all over the news. Um, especially the national news and more often in recent years. Um, the headlines are really scary uh, with the words of toxic and lethal. They talk about um, livestock deaths and dog deaths, um, drinking water issues like the Toledo water crisis in 2014. Uh, and New Jersey was no, uh, no different, in, especially in 2019. You really couldn't escape hearing about algae in New Jersey. Um, there were widespread, persistent, and highly publicized blooms in Lake Hapakong and Greenwood Lake, um, a, among a lot of other water bodies in New Jersey, but those two were the ones I think that were most in the news. Um, but why now? Is this, is this a new phenomenon in, in the U.S., in New Jersey? No, no, it is not new. Um, it's just one of these things that once you start to pay attention to these things, you see them more often. Um, 
And then there's some other reasons why you probably hear about them now more than you have in the past. And I'll give you a little spoiler alert that more advanced science leads to more public health guidance um, and warming temperatures and more stormwater definitely leads to more algae. Um, and just pay special attention to that last headline there, um, which mentions one of the governor's initiatives for HABs, um, $13 million. I just believe that that's, that's likely just gonna be the beginning of funding um, for HABs in New Jersey. So, so many buzzwords and let's just try to pull them out um, so that we can really try to understand what all of it means. You all came here for the high school biology refresher, um, right? That's why you're here. Um, so first things first, contrary to the name, blue-green algae is not actually algae uh, at all. Algae are eukaryotes um, and cyanobacteria are actually bacteria, which are prokaryotes. Um, the prokaryotes can be unicellular and live by themselves, or they can form colonies or filaments. So you see on that picture there, you see some colonies there, and then the filaments is the really long piece. Um, definitely no social distancing going on between those cells there. Um, and cyanobacteria can photosynthesize and they contain the pigment phycocyanin, um, hence the cyano in the name. Um, they're very, very common in the environment um, and they do serve as the base of the food chain. So they are very important. Um, they're actually one of the oldest living organisms and they were responsible for the great oxygenation event about 3 million years ago um, that was essential to forming our atmosphere. So I guess we can all say thank you to cyanobacteria. So they're pretty cool organisms. They've lasted a really long time. They've been around for a really long time. So they have to be pretty special to have made it this far. Um, so they do have some fun facts. Um, so one of those is that they can regulate their own buoyancy in the water column, that they can go up and down um, in search of light or nutrients. Some cyanobacteria can fix atmospheric nitrogen, which means that they can take nitrogen from the air um, and then, which isn't really helpful for plant growth. And then they can make it into a form that is usable for them. And they can get those usable forms of nitrogen from soil as well and sediment um, at the bottom of lakes, but some. Um, they do have specialized cells that can go dormant and can overwinter. Remember that these are always going to be in our water bodies um, and they are a natural and important part of our food web. Um, so they're always present, but it is those bloom conditions that are the problem. Um, and that's and the reason why they can be problematic is that they can produce toxins, but they don't always produce, to produce toxins. Um, so again, these toxins can be present in normal conditions, but uh, in such small amounts. Uh, that they don't have an effect on people with minimal contact with the water. There's always going to be some age groups and populations that are more sensitive. Um, and even some cyanotoxins can be extremely harmful in small amounts. So what is a bloom that we're defining here? Um, the bloom that we're referring to in the phrase harmful algal bloom is the overgrowth of Microsoft, microscopic photosynthetic organisms. And this can be true algae, it can be diatoms, it can be cyanobacteria. When most people are using that term, HAB or harmful algal bloom, um, these days they're likely referring to the cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. Um, but even things like diatoms or true algae can be problem can be problematic, um, and diatoms especially can be an issue when it comes to water supply, as they can clog filters in water treatment plants. So what do these blooms look like? Um, now I'm going to talk about cyanobacteria HABs and showing what these pictures, uh, what these blooms can look like. So they can have many different visual presentations. Uh, from spilled paint to pea soup, um, from green to brown to blue, to even pink, which I don't have a picture of here. Um, but even the same dominant species can look different from one day to the next. And since I mentioned that cyanobacteria can regulate their buoyancy in the water column and that they can go up and down, depending on the time of day, you might not see a surface bloom, uh, but it might be there. And that final picture that showed up there on the right, um, we collected a water sample at the same time of this. And I don't think it looks very bad when you look at the picture there. Um, which is about three feet below the surface there, there was over 200,000 cyanobacteria cells per milliliter, which is quite a lot and would definitely be considered a bloom. Um, so it's just one of those things that it might not look too bad when you see it, but it actually can be bad underneath. So our colleagues and friends across the way from our office, um, we our office happens to be right on Spruce Run Reservoir, um, but our colleagues across the way at Spruce Run Recreation Area did a fabulous job in 2019 documenting so many visual presentations at Spruce Run Reservoir. So this is just at one water body in one season. Um, 
and everything it, it ranges from kind of blue to fuzzy even um, to scummy there's even some yellow streak um, and so there's a lot of different visual presentations and so the taxa did change over the course of the season um, but you can just see that it, it can vary so much um, even just considered a, a hab so there can be some false alarms that you have out there not everything that you see that looks like a hab might be a hab um, so I'm just going to go through some of these quickly. Um, so this is one is duckweed. This is actually a small floating aquatic plant. It's really common, but oftentimes I've, I've been guilty of it myself. I drive by a water body. You see this green stuff covering, covering a small pond and you think it's a hab, but actually it's probably duckweed, uh, small aquatic plant. Um, it could be another small aquatic plant that's even smaller than duckweed, uh, which is water meal. Um, but again, you can see the picture there. The person is holding the water meal with their bare fingers. If you think it's a hab, definitely touch. If you were going to touch this, you should be wearing gloves. You shouldn't touch a potential hab um, with your bare hands. Uh, but water meal, you can see, I mean, you just see that picture there. It really looks like, looks like a hab and that definitely is a false alarm. Um, green algae that can cause, um, it can be filamentous, can definitely look like a hab um, and this one this is a true algae here so this could be a true algae bloom um, but again this one is not not going to be the harmful the cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms that we're talking about and not cyanobacteria but this is a euglena uh, which is an algae bloom um, and they can really look like cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms um, and you even have to get under the microscope to really see that this was not cyanobacteria um, and these true algae blooms can be harmful, um, especially to fish, since they can alter water chemistry, like dissolved oxygen or pH. Um, and sometimes these algae blooms can result in fish kills. Um, and this would not be a cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom. Not that this one did result in a fish kill, but it could. Um, there's a lot of dynamics when it comes to phytoplankton. Um, so keep in mind what you see might be a true algae bloom. It could be a cyanobacteria bloom, um, and it could be harmful. Um, so it is always best to err on the side of caution. And if you see something that looks like this and you're not sure, um, then you should definitely report it and err on the side of caution um, when coming into contact with it. So why do blooms form? Um, there's a few key, key, key factors that contribute to cyanobacteria bloom. Um, when you typically hear about HABs, it's probably during the summer. And that's not just because that's when most people are interacting with the water body. Um, they wanna swim in the lake um, and that's gonna prevent them from doing that. Most cyanobacteria thrive in warmer temperatures and increased sunlight, which comes with the springtime. Um, but there are some cyanobacteria that can even survive under ice. And in New Jersey this year, it was definitely confirmed that we did have cyanobacteria that was blooming in the winter. Um, so it is more likely for blooms to form in slower moving water, um, just by nature. Uh, that's just the best way, that's the best habitat for them, but they can persist even in flowing systems like rivers. Um, and there have been documented instances of blooms traveling over 500 miles downstream in a river. Um, so it's not to say this it's not one size fits all. Um, and definitely the thing you've probably heard about in the news is increased nutrients, uh, specifically phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, they do play an integral role in providing food for cyanobacteria. Um, these increased nutrient levels can come from stormwater runoff, which can carry fertilizers or pet waste into water bodies, uh, failing septic systems, or even from internal lake cycling. Uh, there are many lake system dynamics that I won't have time to get into today, uh, but internal cycling is why some water bodies have recurrent blooms, uh, ones that appear at the same time every year, like the fall. Um, late fall usually is when water temperatures mix in a lake, especially when it's a little bit deeper, uh, and nutrients can be released from sediment at the bottom of the lake that can then feed to and contribute to a bloom. So by nature, an overgrowth of cells means the system is out of balance. And what are we gonna say that a bloom is harmful to? Are we talking about harmful to humans, to animals, to fish, to the environment? There's a lot of different ways that we can define harmful. Um, most of the time, when we're talking about harmful algal blooms, we are referring to them, especially cyanobacteria ones, as harmful to humans, um, but they can be harmful to fish, to animals, um, especially pets um, and livestock. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. These blooms can result in water quality changes like decreased dissolved oxygen um, or changes in pH that can definitely be an issue um, for aquatic species as well. Um, I've seen pH, pH can increase 
really rapidly when a bloom is forming. So even I've seen it uh, above nine. I've heard that it can be to 10 or 11, and that's that's really high for pH. You definitely drop out and create a big issue for fish. Um, and it's not just the toxins that can be produced and released from the cyanobacteria that can be harmful. Um, there's a component of the cell wall that's called uh, lipopolysaccharides that can be harmful to humans and can create a skin or allergic reaction. Um, this is the primary reason why the number of cells in the water is used as, as an advisory level, and it's not just the toxins um, that are in the water um, that can be it can be the issue. So if you see cell counts are the reason why there is an advisory, it, could, it is because of that. Um, so there are other non-toxin issues that could come out of cyanobacteria, um, like taste and odor compounds that might affect drinking water. Um, these are things that are not necessarily harmful, but they can be a nuisance. That's why they call them taste and odor issues. Um, water purveyors are often monitoring for these as part of their water treatment processes. So they know about this and they are trying to manage them the best that they can. Um, while talking about drinking water, this is a good time to note that cyanotoxins are not regulated in finished drinking water um, at this time. So your water purveyor may or may not be routinely testing for toxins, um, and that would be voluntarily at this time. Water purveyors have been encouraged, um, but again, not required to develop cyanotoxin management plans, which typically includes an evaluation of their source water uh, to determine if they have a cyanoto uh, cyanobacteria risk. Um, there are many standard water treatment processes that are potentially in place that are effective at cyanotoxin removal. Um, so if you do have questions about your, uh, your water treatment process, uh, which can vary very significantly between plants, um, you should contact your water company directly. Um, but the toxins that you might encounter with, um, with coming into contact with the water, um, they could produce the toxins, the cyanotoxins um, can affect the liver, the kidneys, the stomach, the nervous system, aside from the skin reactions, um, they very said. And it's really important to note that cell density does not, does not equal the toxin level. You could have a low cell count and have a very high toxin level or a specific toxin that is really toxic even at low levels, so it may not be a lot of toxin. Um, or you could have a high cell count and low toxin level and anywhere in between. Um, so if you, if you see one or the other, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the other is high or low. Um, so I could go really deep into a microbiological lesson here, uh, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this high level. And the take home message is going to be here when we talk about cyanotoxins. That there is still a lot of information that we still don't understand yet and that science has not caught up with yet. Um, so cyanobacteria can begin producing cyanotoxins at any time. Uh, they, their environmental factors, including water chemistry, that are believed to play a role. In, in this, uh, but these triggers are not really fully understood at this time. Um, so, and keep in mind that even if a bloom is sampled and analyzed and those to toxins were present at the time, that might not be true even a little bit later, um, since they can be begin producing them at any time. Um, so different species can specialize in the toxins that they produce, and some species can produce multiple types of toxins. Um, so again, pretty advanced for being single cells. Um, and some of the toxins can be released um, all the time. Some can be released when naturally when the cell is damaged or dies through predation or natural cell death, um, or can be released uh, by artificial means, like if you applied an algicide, um, and then the toxin would be released through the water, quality, water system. So there's three cyanotoxin groups that have health advisory guidelines in New Jersey. Um, and so those are the only ones that I'm including here on this slide. And this table is a lot to take in, and I don't expect you to read all of it now, and I'm not going to read all of this here. Um, the link to this table will be provided in the resources at the end. Um, but just to quickly go over them, um, the three main ones that you'll hear about are microcystin LR, cylindrospermopsins, which is really fun to learn how to say, so you can practice that later, um, and anatoxin A. Um, so the largest group of cyanotoxins believed to be produced by all the cyanobacteria, most of them, is microcystin. Um, and this is probably the most common um, toxin that you'll find. And it does uh, essentially the, there's up to 200 types of microcystins or over 200 types of microcystins, um, and they're called congeners. Um, but microcystin LR, LR seems to be the most prevalent ones. So that's the one that are mostly um, monitored for. Um, and they can cause, um, they it targets the liver. Um, and yes, yeah, so you can see there's a lot of different species that can produce that. 
Um, cylindrous spermopsins can cause toxicity to the liver, kidney, and red blood cell. Um, and anatoxin A is toxic to the nervous system. And in some cases, this has been implicated in wildlife and domestic animal deaths. Um, there's another toxin that you may hear about, which is called saxitoxin, which is historically concerned in marine ecosystems for shellfish consumption. Um, but that is also produced by freshwater species. And that has also been um, in, um, domestic animal deaths uh, also. So the guidelines for New Jersey, um, these are these are the ones that are set forth by New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so they've developed health advisory guidelines and action levels for uh, microsystem cylindrous formopsin and anatoxin A, um, and also an action level for cyanobacterial cell counts greater than 20,000 cells per milliliter where primary rec recreation contact is likely to occur. Um, so you may find, just as you might find acceptable threshold levels on any number of water quality parameters between different states, um, you'll find the same thing here when it comes to um, cyanotoxins and cell counts. Um, so EPA may provide some baseline guidance, but the states have the ability to take that further to protect their residents. Um, so what you'll find here, um, these numbers are in the DEP's HAB response strategies, um, which has a full appendix that has the derivation of the health advisory guidance and action levels so of how they got to these numbers. Um, so you'll find that these are well-researched numbers. Um, they're supported by a number of public health organizations um, have a lot of scientific research out there. Um, so the guidelines are also meant to be protective of the most vulnerable populations as well. Um, so you can see even between the different toxins, the levels are very different um, between those health advisory guidelines. So if you're in New Jersey, you might've seen these signs. Um, there's a suspected, uh, a warning yellow suspected signs. Um, and these ones are posted um, when a bloom is pending test results, and that could be the cell counts and toxin analyses um, to determine if a HAB is present or not. Um, it's one of these just, just to be aware, um, but you, shouldn't, you should avoid contact with the water body if you see these um, until, until you get further information. Um, and once a bloom has been confirmed, then the red HAB present signs are post. As I said, these blooms can move in the water column and even move around a water body. Um, but if you see one of these signs, you should respect them um, until the sign has been, uh, has, the signs will be removed after follow-up testing has confirmed that a bloom has dissipated. So, and this is why you should just pay attention to the signs and believe, believe who posted them, um, why they were there for a reason. So just look at the time on this. Um, and this is just in, you know, about three and a half hours and it just went from a little bit of green to then very green and conditions can change quickly. So this is from the exact same location as I stood there for just a little bit of time. And this was blown into this area by wind, um, but it is something that you can just, you know, conditions can change quickly. So even if you don't have, uh, when you come to a water body, it might change um, even over the course of the day. And cells will typically accumulate near shore, but that is where people are most likely gonna have contact with a water body. Um, they're fishing or trying to climb into a boat. And this is at a boat launch. So the New Jersey DEP is responsible for the statewide um, response for HABs. Um, so any potential HAB report should be reported to DEP, uh, which will coordinate further monitoring and response. There's lots of groups throughout the state, including DEP, USGS, Water Supply Authority, um, research institutions, including universities, lake management consultants firms, and other local groups like Lake and Watershed Associations to conduct water monitoring efforts to better understand HABs. Um, so I'm just gonna cover some of the tools that are used um, for, for monitoring for HABs. Um, there are handheld meters. There's a lot of variability between these. Some of these can be really sophisticated. Some can be uh, pretty simple. Um, but a lot of these, if you are looking to monitor a HAB, you want one that measures phycocyanin, uh, which again is that blue-green pigment in cyanobacteria. Um, and then you can look at other water quality parameters. As I mentioned, you can often see if pH has changed or dissolved oxygen. Um, they can provide some indication of a HAB. Um, you can also take water quality grab samples. That's really the only way to confirm the identification, the cell count, and the toxin levels by taking a grab sample. Um, I really like this, this middle image here, which is the top view of a glass bottle that it really doesn't look like a HAB when you're looking at the water, but then you can see all of those tiny filaments 
Um, and most of those are all cyanobacteria um, that were in the sample that we grabbed. Um, and then there are some really innovative technologies that are out there um, for mon monitoring water bodies. Um, that floating yellow thing there um, is a water quality monitoring buoy that collects data and then um, transmits it to a website that you can view in real time, um, which is pretty neat to be able to kind of track a bloom remotely. And it's in the middle of, um, that one is particularly in the middle of Spruce Run Reservoir. Um, and then the map on the right um, shows aircraft flyovers conducted by DEP uh, for HAB monitoring. And it uses the fixed wing aircraft that's fitted with the remote sensing technology that can uh, detect the phy phycocyanotype that's at the surface. Um, and then there are other remote sensing tools out there like EPA Cyan app that uses satellites. Um, so the flyovers give us a little bit closer to the ground look, um, but there are some really innovative technologies out there um, just so you keep an eye out um, for, for the new things that are out there. So how can blooms be managed? Um, and again, there is no one size fits all. Lake dynamics are really complicated. Every water body is so different and you would need, um, Oftentimes you do need uh, years of baseline water monitoring and studies to really be able to effectively manage a HAB, uh, whether it be proactive or reactive. Um, there are lots of options that might work for one lake that would actually make a HAB worse in another lake. Uh, so you should consult with a lake management professional uh, before just taking action. Um, every option for managing blooms has pros and cons. Um, so those options need to be weighed out when it comes to managing a water body. Uh, I know that for water supply, we need to take uh, extra special precautions um, when it comes to water supply side of things um, that may work differently than a recreational water body. Um, so I'm going to provide in the resource links um, a link that describes some of these options in greater detail. Um, but some of those that you might have heard of are algicides, um, circulation, including aerators, um, nutrient inactivation. Um, they're trying to bind that phosphorus um, or ultrasonic technologies. There's a lot of different options out there. Um, but again, just uh, it's not a one size fits all. So what can you do? Um, it's recommended that you respect the posted advisories. They're put there for a reason. I watched this guy climb into his kayak there with his bare legs into this really lovely green bloom. And I don't even think he noticed uh, that he was even looking. Um, and I just was very disgusted. Um, but you can report suspected HAB events. Um, there's only, as I said, DEP is the one that coordinates that. So there's only two ways to do that. Um, that you can call the 1877-WARN-DEP hotline, um, or you can use the WARN-NJDEP app, which is available for iTunes, Google Play, and Windows Phone. Um, so those are the only ways to report a HAB. If you follow up with your local health department, they're going to have to report it to DEP as well. Um, the, whole, the whole HAB strategy goes through DEP um, at this time. So um, it's better just to, to go directly there if you think, um, think you see a HAB. Um, so again, there's the that's what the the icon looks like if you search for the um, the DEP warn the warn DEP have uh, app. So other things that you can do, you might not have all the fancy tools that the professionals have, and I know that there are some professionals that are on this webinar. Um, but you can also be community water monitors for HABs in New Jersey soon. Um, so the New Jersey Watershed Watch Network will be hosting a webinar in June to discuss new a new HAB monitoring platform. Um, including an equipment loan program that's been moved to, uh, it's been pushed back to 2021 at this time due to COVID-19. Uh, but this, this program is going to allow that citizen scientists can adopt a water body um, and assist with HAB monitoring. Um, but even visual inspections are extremely helpful at all times of the year. Um, so providing information. So if you're, if you're interested in you know, kind of giving some on the ground look for your water body, you should definitely sign up um, for the city, uh, the, Watershed Watch Network uh, webinar. Um, you can go to um, to sign up for that. Um, they will also have a visual lake assessment program as well. So you can sign up and get on their list or participate in any of their other trainings um, just to keep an eye on your water body. And since we've already talked about that nutrients can contribute to HABs, um, the basic things you can do to reduce stormwater pollution, specifically reducing fertilizer usage um, and intercepting stormwater in rain gardens and rain barrels and making sure that your septic system is maintained um, and working well, and you can always pick up after your pets. 
encouraging you to learn more. Um, that response strategy that I mentioned from DEP, um, this is DEP's Cyanohab website. Uh, it has a lot of really great information here, um, but that response strategy, you can just click right on that link right on the top bar there um, to get all that information for DEP's response strategy. Um, and if you wanna know what HAB events are going on in the state, um, where there are current HABs or which ones have been removed, um, if you wanna check to see, um, if there's been follow up monitoring that's been done to remove a HAB um, from being an active HAB, you can always go to the HAB events tab um, and then they update this. So there will be a 2020 HAB events page um, that's up now. So you can check on which HAB events are going on now. Um, again, lots of really great information on the DEP Cyano HAB page. And that's it for me. Hopefully, you found that informative and helpful. And thanks for joining us today. And uh, if there are any questions, you let me know. Thanks so much, Heather. That was awesome. Um, the one question we have is about, um, given the state of the state budget, um, is there expected funding for HABs in the future? Um, and someone mentioned that maybe there might be alternatives to state funding um, like a stormwater implementing um, a local or regional stormwater utility um, that could be directed towards HABs. Um, so can you speak about that a little bit? Um, the, only, the only thing I can speak to is that I know that the HABs funding um, that DEP put out there, that that is still moving forward. Um, we at the Water Supply Authority have been, we were awarded a HABs grant from DEP for as part of that funding, um, and that is still moving forward. Um, it's still a governor's initiative, even with the um, with the adjustments to the state budget, the, the state fiscal year. Um, so I know that that's moving forward. Um, I know there is other HABs funding out there uh, that may not be through New Jersey State. Um, but there's other HABs funding through uh, the USGS, um, and there may be other groups out there that that do have HABs funding as well. Um, and one more question. Um, do you have off the top of your head any recommendations for educational resources about HABs and algal blooms for middle school students? I, I don't at this time, um, but that is something that we had talked about um, through our River Friendly Schools program potentially developing, um, since that is such a hot button issue here in New Jersey. Um, so it's just another push that we need to get on that. Uh, but I will try and see if I, um, I might have some contacts that might have some information. Awesome. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. So um, unless anyone has anything else, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Thanks to Heather and Kyle for the great presentations. And hopefully we will see you next week for the groundwater uh, protection webinar at the same time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah.